This is a CBC Podcast. Want a weekly roundup of the best CBC Radio programming? Subscribe to the CBC Radio 1 newsletter. Get a digest of the week's top stories. Read in-depth articles. Listen to interviews and documentaries. And get the lowdown on upcoming stories from CBC Radio 1 that you need to hear. To subscribe, go to cbc.ca slash radio and look for the subscribe button. The CBC Radio 1 newsletter. Be informed. Danse, Anin, Bujou, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Let me ask you this. What if you turned on your tap and nothing came out? Or the water that did come out was contaminated? Depending on where you live, clean water is something many of us take for granted. We don't even have to think about it. But that's not the reality for many Indigenous communities. And while the federal government has committed to lifting all long-term drinking water advisories on reserves in the next two years, the work is slow and costs billions of dollars. It's a cause that continues to inspire artists, activists, and even entrepreneurs across the country who are speaking out and raising awareness. Today on Unreserved, I'm not going to overwhelm you with stats. Instead, I'm going to introduce you to some Indigenous people working to turn the tide. For all of Marcus Morin's life, he wasn't supposed to drink out of the taps on his home community of Enoch Cree Nation. Water in that nation, just west of Edmonton, had high levels of arsenic and other substances in it. Every weekend, his mom would take him to the city to wash white clothes that they didn't want to be stained with a rust color. And Morin still has vivid memories of growing up without safe running water to drink. It was tough. You know, you couldn't go to your tap, just turn on your water, grab a cup of fresh H2O, uh, just as simply as you would uh, in Edmonton or any other big city uh, around Alberta itself. But going to the store, grabbing a big jug of water is kind of how we had our fresh water supply to ourselves. That's our main source. Otherwise than that, we would be boiling our water. Instead of leaving his home community, Morin decided he wanted to be part of the solution. In 2009, I went to a camp with uh, my junior high, St. Thomas More. It was uh, part of the Aboriginal program in the city. We stayed there for the weekend, we camped away, and on the third final day, they, they had a career plan here. Let's, let's do a career plan for everybody here. Let's all set goals. And within that time frame, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just kind of put pen to paper, and I said, you know, it'd be nice to build the infrastructure, be a part of it, and actually run and operate that place afterwards. In January of 2019... It happened. The plant put the 25-year boil water advisory to an end, meaning the 4,000 community members in Enoch could safely drink from their taps. And Morin was right there to witness the moment he'd been dreaming about for a decade. I never realized I wanted to be a water operator until I heard that we were actually building and getting the approval of the water supply upgrade up out in Enoch here. So, And it wasn't until last Christmas... uh, In December of 2018, I found a book 10 years ago I had written in it. uh, I wanted to be an operator and go in that regards and be able to share with my daughter. His daughter is one of the many reasons he wanted to make this difference in his home community. Now he's a junior water operator at the plant. He took us inside the plant to explain how it works. So this is where the water is actually starting to come from, the River Cree, which comes from Edmonton itself. comes in and we actually push it straight into the water reservoirs themselves they have four water reservoirs and then we go shooting up it goes straight into the water reservoirs itself after that we restore it in there we have the pumps on the other side of here actually itself there's four pumps we have one pump continuously running to push water back up and out through the distribution system here the water will come back out from above down and this is what leads to the village here which feeds the community or the water grid itself For Morin, it's all about making sure his daughter and other young Cree have access to safe drinking water. He remembers spending a lot of time at the local hockey rink, where kids would bring their own water. Morin used to drink out of the taps anyway, not sure what he was putting in his body. Now, kids don't have to do that anymore. 
a, I see a lot of youth now outside the youth center playing on the skate park, playing on the, the old bike track outside there. And in the wintertime, they're always inside the gym infrastructures, you know, kind of doing that thing. But I think, you know, having your own water supply and own demand, maybe you can create a, a sprinkler or water park for some the youth to kind of have another hangout in the summer times and do their thing, right, and keep them off, off and out of trouble and going forward, right? Water is everything. You, you need it to make your food. You need it for cleaning, like I says, and in our ceremonies, we do need that, right? If you don't get plants without water, you don't get trees without water, you don't get anything. Water is everything. Warren says the upgrade was a long time coming, but he's happy to see it through himself. It, it was a surprise to see it take this long. It was. I think a lot of growth could have happened a lot sooner. You have the water supply upgrade happen a lot quicker. But that being said, everything happens for a reason. My job wouldn't have been my job if I wouldn't have had this happen now. That was Marcus Morin, who is a junior water operator at the Enoch Cree Nation water plant. Thanks to CBC Edmonton's Andrea Ross and Scott Newfeld for sharing that story with us. Still to come as we talk about the challenges of getting clean drinking water to First Nations, how do you get that story out so it reaches outside those communities? Well, a new book from Scholastic is planning to do just that. 40% of our community still doesn't have clean drinking water. And we're literally touching the French town of Maniwaki. Mm. And everybody in the town of Maniwaki has clean drinking water. Our community doesn't. We get those blue big jugs delivered. They're just something that doesn't sit well. And we need to bring awareness about that. That was Sunshine Tanesco, author of Nabi's Water Song. More of her story in just a few minutes. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Today we're talking about water, a topic my next guest has already dedicated a lot of her time to. I'm doing this work as we can't just pray anymore. We must do something, and we need to do it now. I need to get right into this message so you feel where I'm coming from. I can't stress enough what I have learned about the water from my elders in our ceremonies. Many people don't think water is alive or has a spirit. My people believe this to be true. That's Autumn Peltier addressing the UN General Assembly on World Water Day last year at the age of 13. Autumn is from Wikwimikong First Nation, and her work as a water activist was inspired by her great aunt Josephine Mandamin. Josephine was a well-known water walker. She walked 17,000 kilometers around the Great Lakes. Josephine co-founded Mother Earth Water Walk. And like other water walkers, she walked great distances to advocate for protecting the health of our waters. Josephine passed away last month. This year, Autumn and her late great aunt are receiving the Water Warrior Award at the Water Dock Film Festival in Toronto. Autumn, welcome. Hi. Hi. Now, you've been described as a water warrior. How do you feel about that title? I don't know. It makes me feel like a warrior. (laughs) (laughs) What do you call yourself? After, like, all my work, people just call me the water girl, so I kind of just, like, stick with the water girl, I guess. (laughs) What influence did uh, your great Aunt Josephine Mandeman have on you and your desire to do this work? My Aunt Josephine is the reason I do this work because since I was a little girl, she's kind of She's been teaching me um, about the importance of water and the sacredness of it. Mm-hmm. And so after I like learned about like what a boil water advisory was when I was eight years old, I think, that kind of like was my like drive to start advocating. Mm-hmm. After I kind of like understood more what my Auntie Josephine was like talking about and like what her, her point was, kind of like hit me mm-hmm. and made me kind of like want to like jump in with her. When you think of back uh, about your time with your auntie, what kind of person was she? She was a really good person and she was like, she inspired a lot of people and she inspired me. Mm-hmm. You and your auntie are the recipients of this year's Water Warrior Award. What does this award mean to you? Well, this award means a lot to me since I'm accepting my auntie's award on her behalf. So it's a lot more important to me and it's just a huge honor. Mm. What kinds of things do you want people to know when, when you're accepting the award? I want people to know, like, what me and my auntie's work was. And that's advocating for water. Why is yeah. that important for you to do? Well, it's important for me to do because 
Now I'm carrying on my auntie's work, and since she can't do it anymore, I'm going to continue it for her, and she asked before she passed away that I continue doing her work for her. Mm, That must have been very emotional for you. Yeah. When you addressed the UN General Assembly on World Water Day last year, you had said, many people don't think water is alive or has a spirit. My people believe this to be true. Can you explain what that means? In my teachings, in my way, water has a spirit and water is alive. I don't know really how to explain it. It's just like, it's a belief. Mm -hmm. We respect the water like it's a human being. Because it gives so much life, right? Yeah. Yeah. At the UN, you also called upon world leaders to warrior up. (laughs) What did you mean by that? I mean, like, take action because, like, you see all over, like, the news and, like, people's, like, Instagram feeds. You see a bunch of, like, videos and, like, "This this is happening and this is happening. And, like, we need to take action now before it's too late. And it's, and now I feel like it's almost too late. One of the world leaders that you're talking about was Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, in fact, There's an iconic picture of you when you gave him the water vessel, the copper water vessel. Can you tell me about that? What was that like for you? What happened there was um, I was told to give him the gift and just just give him the gift. And I'm not supposed to say anything. So as I went up there, I didn't know I was going to say anything. And so I just like walked up. And then as I was like handing it to him, I said, I'm very unhappy with the choices you've made and broken promises to my people. And then he said, I understand that. And I started crying. And then I said, the pipelines. And then he said, I'll protect the water. Hmm. Do you feel like he's done that? No. 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 So as people start to think more about a relationship with water, what, what changes do you hope to see? What do you want Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to do? If he was listening, what would you say to him today? I would tell him to, I don't know, help clean more water, like for First Nations communities that still don't have drinking water. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you want people to know about about uh, First Nations people and their drinking water? Well, there's some First Nations communities that have been on boil water advisories most of their lives and some people all of their lives. And there's kids that are growing up not knowing what it's like to drink out of a tap or bathe with the water from their shower or wash their hands or brush their teeth with the water from their taps. It's hard for some people, and I want that to change. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like it's going to be young people that are going to are going to lead the warrior movement that you that you currently lead? Yeah, because it's our generation that's coming next, and it's our future. Well, Autumn, thank you so much for taking some time with me today. Congratulations again. Thank you. That was 14-year-old Autumn Pelte from Wikwimikong First Nation. She and her late great-aunt Josephine Mandeman received the Water Warrior Award at the Water Doc Film Festival in Toronto. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Today on the show, we're talking about clean water. Who has it? Who needs it? And now everyday people are inspired to act. For every 40 bags of coffee sold, buys one water filter for one family, one home. And I've got lots to buy. Still ahead, find out how an Indigenous coffee company is getting water filtration systems into the homes of First Nation families in Ontario. Nibby's Water Song is a new picture book coming out in July. It tells the story of a little girl named Nibby who's thirsty and can't find clean water to drink. Not from her tap, not from a local river. So she heads to the next town and starts knocking on doors, looking for a safe source of drinking water. It was written by Sunshine Tenasco, who is Anishinaabe from Kitaganzibi in Quebec, and illustrated by Chief Ladybird, who is Chippewa and Potawatomi from Rama and Moose Deer Point First Nations, both in Ontario. Sunshine joins me from our Ottawa studio, and Chief Ladybird is on the phone with us from Toronto. Welcome to you both. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sunshine, can you tell me what inspired you to write Nibby's Water Song? Uh, there are sort of a lot of factors. Um, one, it's uh, mainly because of a project that I started a couple of years back, and it's uh, 
to bring more awareness about the need to make clean drinking water a human right in Canada. And so water has been sort of on my my mind for the past uh five years now and thinking about it and giving workshops all over the place people would often ask do you do you do something for younger children and um, so writing a book has sort of been always in the background mm. and um, yeah my my parents are teachers elementary teachers so yeah that's sort of what triggered it oh, what's the name of the project uh, her braids oh. now there's also a connection based on your home community as well can you tell me about that Yeah, so 40% of our community still doesn't have clean drinking water and 60% does. And we're literally touching the French town of Manawaki. And everybody in the town of Manawaki has clean drinking water and still 40% of our community doesn't. We get those blue big jugs delivered. There's just something that doesn't sit well and we need to bring awareness about that. Mm. You're also a mother and, and you read a lot with your own children. How did they inspire the book? Well, I mean, I have four children and my oldest is 18. So I've been reading children's books for a mm-hmm. long, long time. So uh, I know uh, Monique Gray Smith, mm-hmm. she wrote a book and I accidentally walked into chapters the day that it was released <laughs> and seen it on the top of the escalators. It was like one of those moments and it was just like coming up the escalators and I seen this little brown girl on the cover and I knew immediately I was like, what? I have to buy that book for my for my girls. And, uh, yeah, opened it up and it just got better and better, that book. And um, and I was like, wow, you know, we need to see more of this. And if we don't do it, who's going to do it, right? So right. that's sort of that sort of what kickstarted everything. Mm, I understand you have a daughter named Nabi as well. I do. My second one. She's 13 years old. And does she think she's the star of the book? She <laughs> thinks she's the star. The other kids are like, what? As if she gets a book. So uh, I don't know. Maybe in the future you'll see three more books. Yeah, you get <laughs> on that get on that <laughs> exactly so let's talk a bit about bringing this book to life chief lady bird how did you react when sunshine and scholastic reached out to you to be the illustrator oh i was super excited i it didn't take much convincing scholastic was like pitching it to me and being like if you're interested let us know i was like i don't even need to think about this mm-hmm. this is a yes like right off the top because mm-hmm. i respect sunshine and the work that she does with her braids and then uh, just like like what she was saying, we need to have more books like this for our young people. I think about when I was really young, we, did, we didn't have any books like this. And um, specifically something that I've been sort of meditating on throughout the process of this was when I was in third grade and we were doing a unit on like the pioneers and stuff like that. And, and I was kind of um, questioning what we were being taught because I recognized that like our story wasn't being told within that. Mm-hmm. And my teacher told me that my parents were lying to me about us being Indigenous because Indigenous people didn't exist anymore. Um, and so I I still kind of hold on to, to stuff like that. Mm. So I, I just think that it's really exciting that our young people get to have these books and these resources and this information that validates them and um, helps them feel seen, helps them feel represented. And then I know there's going to be some young Indigenous girls who are going to see this and feel so so seen and that makes me feel really good. Mm. What was it like for you to bring such an important topic to life through your art? It was a process. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's emotional in a lot of ways. Through this process, I'm able to take care of my child self um, and work through a lot of that stuff. And there's, there's just a lot of healing that happens. And actually, one reason why I included my dog in it, which actually I didn't even know that Nippy that you had a daughter named Nibi, which is really cool because then I put my dog into it. And (laughs) that's not the same as having a kid, but you know what I mean? (laughs) Mm, Yeah. Um, I thought that right away when I seen Ludo, by the way, I was like, oh, that's freaking cute. (laughs) (laughs) He also thinks he's the star of the book. (laughs) Um, But like throughout the process, like having him in the book was like a source of comfort because he's my best friend and, and he comes with me to everything that I do. And so... I love being able to also inject his spirit into the book as well. Hmm. Sunshine, what was it like when you started seeing the art for the book coming back? Oh my, I can't even. I've been, uh, (laughs) I I, I just can't because I found out about Chief Ladybird because right when we had first started Her Braids, you had posted a a selfie and I sort of like, it caught my eye and I was like, this is interesting. And then I seen your art. So this was a couple of years back and you've sort of been always like, I've been fangirling in private from my house. And so I was just like, I know I want to work with you. I 
hope you say yes. And then when I finally seen it, I was just like, wow, this is real. Like this is really happening and this is going to be available. And so it's super emotional. Like I just busted out crying seeing it for the first time. So I've been super appreciative and just sort of giving um, Chief Ladybird her space to do what she does too. Hmm. You mentioned earlier that you give workshops about water in Indigenous communities, but also outside them. When you talk about people living in Canada without access to clean drinking water, how do you explain that reality to kids who are just used to just turning on the tap? Yeah, I, I go about it in different ways based on based on where I am and how old the, the group is. Mm. For high school kids, we start workshops like, where are you not able to drink water? And everybody says Mexico. And everybody says all these places overseas and everywhere. And I keep pushing and keep pushing. And then I go with, okay, so did you have gym class today or gym class yesterday? And how much water do you think you drink? And and so once, once you know, you get them engaged, then we say, did you know? And we bring around a little graphic sheet and say, all these communities right here, and some of them are really close to where we are. First Nations communities often don't have clean drinking water. And they know right away that, whoa, that's something wrong with that. Why? And they ask why, why? And, I'm, and, and that's sort of the point of it. Yes. Why? Mm -hmm. Why are we falling between the cracks? And that's the perfect question to ask. And sort of that's the reason, that's the answer that we're looking for. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the book is coming out in July, which means by next fall, it will be turning up in the Scholastic Catalog when kids are back in school, which I loved, by the way. What are you most looking forward to about sharing this story and these images with kids all across the country? Personally, I just want all these little brown kids to see themselves on there. Mm -hmm. And I want mm -hmm. them to see that they can be create their own change in a positive and good way. And so that's what I want kids to really feel. And Chief Ladybird, mm -hmm. what about you? I'm really excited for the learning that's going to happen, as well as like the, the young brown kids feeling represented. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's one part in the book where... Um, Nabi is running to the towns that sort of surround her territory, and she gets given, like, a small bottle of water. Mm -hmm. She drinks it all down, and then she becomes really thirsty again. And I love that this is a metaphor for, like, a small fix, right? So it didn't really have these long-term effects that are going to help her and her community, and so she takes it into her own hands and inspires a lot of people, and everyone bands together and finds the solution together. And I really love that aspect of how Sunshine wrote the book, and I, I really think it's going to speak to a lot of young people. And I also love that we we educate in like a positive way. We're not re-traumatizing the kids who are going to be reading this. And mm -hmm. for me as an artist, that's really important for me to find these good ways to talk about these really hard subjects without uh, re-traumatizing. Well, thank you both for uh, spending some time with me. I look forward to the rest of the uh, rest of your books. <laughs> Three more at Three least. More. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having us. That was unexpected and super appreciated. Well, thank you. Yeah, this was awesome. Nibby's Water Song by Sunshine Tenasco, illustrated by Chief Ladybird, will be out in July through Scholastic. It's available for pre-order now. A bag of coffee for clean water. That's the idea behind a coffee business in Ottawa. Birch Bark Coffee Company got off the ground in 2017 and is Ottawa's first entirely First Nation owned and operated coffee venture. The goal of the company is simple. For each bag of coffee sold, a portion of the proceeds will help buy one water purifier for an Indigenous family whose community doesn't have clean water. Mark Marsolet Noah Gabo is the founder of Birch Bark Coffee Company. He's Ojibwe and a member of the Whitefish River First Nation on Georgian Bay. CBC Ottawa's Jessa Runciman met him at a local store where he was dropping off an order. Hi, it's the Birch Bark Coffee. Perfect. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Thank you very much. This is the first place I came in to see it on the shelf, and to see it almost all gone is, is really nice. It just tells me that uh, people really care. Where did this idea come from to begin with? I work in the justice field, first of all, and uh, I'm always dealing with social issues. And uh, the more and more that I was dealing with a lot of the judicial issues, I, a lot of the media that I was reading was with the boiled water advisors, and I didn't realize I knew of them and I knew about them, but I didn't realize really how serious they were. And the more research I did, 
you know, the first thing that was popping into my mind was, oh my God, these are, this is like really, really bad. And I said, how can I, in my own head, I'm saying as an entrepreneur, how can I move to fix this and work on solutions? So, you know, just dreaming, came, in, came up with the coffee idea and uh, my wife said, uh, you know, Mark, if you're going to go for the cause, make sure your coffee is good. So I, I stuck with uh, sustainability of using premium organic, certified fair traded, like top of the line coffee and uh i didn't really have the means to be able to uh provide a roaster um at this point in time so i'm actually doing what we call private labeling and um i've had labels i've hired social media people i've they've helped me create my labels create my bags they're the master roasters that are doing my coffee they've hand selected the beans that i'm going to use after i've explained what i wanted the coffee is roasted locally I've only been launched le- less than two months, and the coffee's just selling like hotcakes. Can you break down the business model for me? Exactly how does this all shake down, money-wise? It's funny you said that, because I never really developed a business plan at the beginning. It was mm-hmm. kind of like the coffee, and then the idea, and then it's kind of gone viral, so I'm kind of doing things backwards. For every 40 bags of coffee sold, it goes towards buying one water purifier. The initial costs of purchasing a unit is per bag is about $2.50. I can, I can afford to put towards the purchase of the coffee, but it, to break it down in, in a larger scale, so it's 40 bags, buys one water filter for one family, one home, and I've got lots to buy. The rest of the money, how does that work out? Uh, are you making a personal profit from this? There isn't a lot of money to be made because, as you know, certified organic coffee is expensive to begin with. It's their second highest commodity being sold. And then after I break down the costs for my advertising, for my social media, for buying the water filters, there is money there for me to make. But it's substantially just paying right now for a lot of my advertising and just supporting the business. So I haven't really generated in two months. I haven't really generated any money for myself yet. So it's all going back into the business. But I hope down the road that, uh, like everybody else, that I can make a living from the coffee and show show the communities and show the First Nations youth that it is possible to run your own business and profit from it. I want to be able to give back eventually by opening cafes up in the communities that are specifically owned by the communities and run by the youth, so a social enterprise where they run it and they learn about businesses, they learn about entrepreneurship, they learn about the accounting, the barista. Why coffee, of all things? It's kind of funny, I, I don't know. I uh, Many moons ago I, I decided... Well, I thought about opening a coffee company up and then I just I just had this dream, this vision of, you know, creating a First Nations coffee company. And when I did some research myself on how many coffee companies were out there across Canada, there wasn't that many. There was just a handful. Then I looked even more so like, OK, well, all these big coffee companies, I said, who's giving, you know, who's giving back in Canada? Who's giving back in their own backyard and who's dealing with the third world conditions? And there was nobody. It really all ties in to, you know, really a platform of colonialism, I think. There's areas that we need to heal. And when I looked at the water issues, I'm just going, it's it's a fundamental right. Like, we should not be going in without clean water. If Canada is considered one of the richest countries, why is it then that we have people still suffering in third world conditions? You know, they've got the mandate 2021, and I give them credit for, you know, implementing it. But in reality is... You know, for every boiled water advisory that gets taken off the website, two or three more pop up. It's just not, it's not right, and it's, it's unfair. You're starting in Curve Lake. How did the community first respond when you pitched this idea to them? Curve Lake has no water plant as of yet today, uh, and they are dealing, they're under the boiled water advisory. So if you look at the community, there's between, roughly between 500 to 700 homes in Curve Lake. So that means right now, I'm raising $70,000 to be able to go into the community and put 700 units in. So I'm, I'm shooting for 700 units. It might be less than that, I'm not sure, but I'll find out when I get there. The funny thing is, is if you look on Health Canada's website and you look at the very last paragraph, And they basically said with the water issues and everything that's going on, that if you're not satisfied with your water, we suggest that you install a certified water purifier. Hence the reason why I'm going forward. And what I'm doing is not rocket science. It's, you know, it should have been done a long time ago. Our our communities, Indigenous communities, have always been let down for decades. We've um, dealt with uh, broken promises. We've been set up for failure many times. So it's not too far from the truth that that a lot of the communities feel like, okay, what's this about? Or, you know, is this a, another broken promise? But I'm real, I'm First Nations, and I'm actually giving back to my own communities. And it's about my integrity too. I, I made a promise and I'm keeping to give back to my communities and I'll do it through the sales of my coffee.
Mark Marcele Nawagabo is the founder of Ottawa's Birch Bark Coffee Company. Since launching, the company has extended their water purifying efforts and earlier this year installed purifiers in Curve Lake First Nation in Ontario. Thanks to CBC Ottawa's Jessa Runciman for sharing that story with us. Still ahead, artists Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch used their paintbrushes to raise awareness of environmental issues. And all of our work is, uh, there's two purposes to it. One is to try and um, inspire people to stand up for the water. You know, because we're at such a crucial time. I mean, the UN came out and said we have about 10 years left before we reach, like, the tipping point of complete catastrophe. And we know that that's not going to be good for our children or grandchildren. We're running out of clean water. And a lot of the animals already don't have clean water. And so it's it's going to be a big thing. It's a big thing now, and it's going to be huger in the future. So we have to protect, you know, everything that we have right now. More with Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch in just a few minutes. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Talking all about the power of water on the show today. H2OO, yeah. For Anishinaabe artist Barry Ace, water is a source of inspiration woven into his work, literally. So when you, uh, when you look at the installation of the blankets, you'll notice they have a very nautical feel. And that comes from a story that my great-grandmother told me. She was born in 1876 and she died in 1976. And she talked about uh, traveling across the North Channel from Manitoulin Island to the mainland in, in punts or wooden boats that weren't motorized. And often they would put up sheets and blankets and catch the wind and harness the wind to get across the channel. The Five Great Lakes is the name of his installation piece based on this story. In it, he uses a combination of beads and wool blankets. So when you're looking at this particular blanket, it is for Lake Ontario, and the other four eddies underneath the blanket represent the other Great Lakes. So this is Lake Ontario, and the other ones are the other four Great Lakes. But also the eddies, they're also referencing the Mijabiju, the other the panther is disturbing the waters from mm-hmm. below. So if we don't respect that water, um, uh, the, the Mijabiju will be upset that we're not respecting it. That was Anishinaabe artist Barry Ace discussing his installation series, The Five Great Lakes, which was inspired by his family's trips by boat from Manitoulin Island to the mainland on Lake Huron. Back in October, artists Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch toured across Canada, partially to paint, but mostly to spread a central message. Water is life. Belcourt, who is Michif, and Murdoch, who is Anishinaabe, teamed up in Edmonton to paint at McEwen University's Indigenous Centre. The bright blue painting shows connection between motherhood, water, and its protectors. The painting sits right in the heart of Alberta, or oil country. But as the two artists tell us, it makes their message all the more important. I'm Christy Belcourt. I'm Mitchiff from Manitouzagigan, which is Lac St. Anne in Alberta. Bom Gizik. My name is Isaac and I'm from Nimkiajbakong. The painting represents natural law. It represents a, a symbol of, of resistance, I guess, against resource extraction. But we also want it to be a symbol of hope that we can actually change this world because, of course, we're, we're suffering a massive ecological collapse. So this painting is about the environment and what we can do to help. Uh, the painting is sort of some soft muted turquoise colors uh, with very two very strong images of uh, in silhouette kind of black of Thunderbird Woman and uh, Thunderbird Mom. Yeah, we have Thunderbird Woman and Thunderbird Mom. And there are these 
these superhero beings that are going to come and help save the earth. And so they do a lot of work and they, they travel all over the world. Well, we've been traveling, uh, I think we've been on the road for about six weeks so far this time, and we've been doing community art builds, murals with community, uh, murals with students, and then and then paintings like this. And all of our work is, uh, there's two purposes to it. One is to try and um, inspire people to stand up for the water. You know, because it, we're at such a crucial time. I mean, the UN came out and said we have about 10 years left before we reach, like, the tipping point of complete catastrophe. And we know that that's not going to be good for our children or grandchildren. We're running out of clean water. And a lot of the animals already don't have clean water. And so it's, it's going to be a big thing. It's a big thing now, and it's going to be huger in the future. So we have to protect, you know, everything that we have right now. It's important for us to be here because of our message about climate change and about global warming and the need for all of us as human beings to act and to act quickly and in unity. And we know that Alberta is um, a place of, of tar sands and tar sands expansion and the tar sands expansion affects many other different waterways away from Alberta uh, and Plus, my, my ancestors are here, my ancestral lands are here, my territory is here in Alberta. So it's very important that we, that we come here and join with other like-minded individuals. And this isn't a, an Indian thing. This is not about race. This is really about building bridges with everybody and saying, look, like we got serious problems. Let's just put the, the cowboy and Indian stuff aside. Let's work together and do something really amazing. That was Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch finishing up their painting in Edmonton. Money raised through commissioning their art went to a language and culture camp for Indigenous kids in northern Ontario. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture and conversation. This episode was produced by Kyle Musica, Zoe Tennant, Stephanie Cram, and Anna Lazowski. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at unreserved at cbc.ca or find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. Ego say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.